Meningitis is inflammation of the outer coverings of the brain. So anything which actually causes this inflammation will cause a meningitis. Today we are talking about Neisseria meningitidis seer group B. This is a nasty bacterium um, which has a habit of actually causing this inflammation of the meninges, hence its name Neisseria meningitidis. Unfortunately, this bacterium doesn't only cause meningitis, it can also cause septicemia, which is blood poisoning um, with devastating effects on the human body. When I was studying to be a pediatrician, I came across the worst experience that uh, a trainee or any doctor can actually go through. I was alone in the emergency room and I get a call from the ambulance crew that there was a baby that was on the way to hospital um, because she had a fever and rash. And when this girl arrived, um, I, I was shocked. This girl was unconscious, um, she wasn't moving, she was cold, she was bruised and bleeding. We did our best that day, but unfortunately the girl passed away a few minutes uh, after she arrived. Obviously once she passed away there wasn't much more we could do, but by chance I met her mother a few months later and we got talking and I told her about what happened that day. And she told me that she woke up normally, she had a fever, so she called the doctor um, and her doctor said I will come as soon as I can. This was 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock. By midday um, she was seeing her get worse and worse, fever was going higher and then she went limp um, and that is when she called the ambulance. By the time the ambulance came, which was minutes, just a few minutes later, she had these bruising and she was losing consciousness and then by the time she got to hospital it was already too late. Everybody's at risk of contracting um, meningococcal meningitis. However, uh, the children most at risk are babies or children up to two years and then again adolescents. In between, we still see cases. However, the majority are children up to two years, adolescents and teenagers and people who travel often. Neisseria meningitidis, the bacterium that causes meningitis, may live in a patient's nose for a while. And then, for some reason, it multiplies many times and this makes it easier for it to spread. Since it lives in the nose and throat, if it's going to spread, it's going to spread by droplet infection from these areas, meaning by sneezing, by kissing, by drinking after somebody, in crowded places where there are a lot of people breathing. So mostly, this infection is spread by close contacts from the breath and droplets. The symptoms of this condition vary, but very often there is fever, headache, the patient looks very unwell. If there is meningitis rather than sepsis, because very often these patients get both, apart from the headache there would also be neck stiffness, so the patient is unable to push the head forward without having pain. So you see these children that are not moving, crying, and eventually they become very lethargic and irritable. Later on, when they develop sepsis, the body starts to have problems with blood clotting and we end up with either a lot of bleeding or otherwise little blood clots. These blood clots eventually will clog the main arteries and veins. Now obviously arteries and veins supply organs and they supply our fingers and toes and arms and legs and depending where these blood clots end up, we end up with problems. So if the blood clot ends up in the heart, you have a heart attack. In the fingers, we end up losing these fingers and toes. But I've seen others lose kidneys and ultimately um, even, even death. One in 10 patients contracting Neisseria meningitidis will end up dying. Out of the survivors, one in five ends up with complications of these blood clots. Some end up needing a kidney transplant, others end up with missing fingers and toes. Also, sometimes parts of the brain are affected because of strokes and they end up blind or even deaf. Everybody should get the meningococcal B vaccine, especially young children. Obviously, these are the ones that are most at risk. Infants in the first year of life would need two doses at two months and four months, a booster dose at age one, and later on, a single booster dose. Over the age of two, 
The course is two doses, separated by two months, and a booster two years later. Over the age of 11, the course is again two doses separated by two months, and the booster dose four years later.